Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in proving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Andres, Hello. how are you? How are you, Dr. Goldcamp? Doing okay. How's my sound? Is that loud enough for you? You're perfectly fine, yes. How was mine? Okay. Yeah, no, you're loud and clear for sure. <laughs> Great, doctor. Good. Yeah, Wi-Fi is good here. How yeah. are you doing? I'm doing okay. So give me a little background. Where are you from? I mean, you're, you're obviously at Harvard now, but you, you, <laughs> don't, you don't have that Boston accent. No, doctor. I'm from Mexico originally. I'm actually here in my hometown, uh, finishing up summer vacation in uh -huh. Mexico. But I study there in, in Boston as an undergrad. And I am very passionate about the, the, the same stuff you are, Good. The ketogenic diet and, and health. How did we well, connect? How do we connect? How do you, how'd you know me? I found you in uh, Dom de Agostino had a list of practitioners that you were using ketogenic therapies to treat diseases or to work with patients. Mm -hmm. And I, I met with Dr. Thomas Seafried, who was there in Boston. And he, when I told him about my project, he was enthusiastic. And he told me like, hey, you should reach out to the people in the front lines, the doctors and the nutritionists that are working directly with patients and just get a feel for what they're doing and, and see if, if your proposal makes sense to them. Um, at a, at a practitioner level. So that's how right. I ended up finding you. Good for you for talking for Tom, by the way. I mean, he's talking about fr uh, leading edge or, or, you know, he's at that. I know it's mouse yes. studies, but, you know, he's changed the world. Yes. And so I'm glad you, I was, it was in the back of my mind, I'm saying, I don't know how much Andres, is it Andres, by the way? Do I say Andres? Andres yes, exactly. An Andres knows, but he's really close to Tom geographically. So I'm glad you did yes. that. That's, that's no, it's, uh, it was one of those coincidences that was very fortunate to, to end up finding him there. I actually, the first time I listened to him was on a podcast and then I was like, oh, this guy's here in Boston actually. So might as well go and seek him out. <laughs> so did so. he make, he's so generous. You know, I mean, it's, it, yes. I, I had a three part podcast with him as well. Mm. And, you know, you, you have to go deeper. You know, he leads you to yes. deeper levels of understanding of what he's working at. Yeah, and I think the, the world is only now starting to catch up to the things he, he has proposed. Like I think it's still very, it, it's still surprising to me that when I talk to some, even some Harvard professors or, or some doctors, hospital managers, whatever, they're still very much in denial or they don't want to accept that having a ketogenic diet is becoming very, very hard to argue that it's the best strategy for, for someone who's at risk or who has cancer. Um, Agreed. Agreed. I, my sense is, so I'm older, and so you tend to accumulate a little more cynicism, you know? Yes. Right? When you're younger, you're clearer, and that's where the answer is. I now see things as, I guess you could say the word agenda, but conflicts of interest, or, you know, what, is, what, what are they associated with? And so, I mean, Harvard's a big university, obviously, and so it's very disparate. You know, you can have yes. opposite opinions in the same place and they're both doing commercially fine. Uh, I forgot Willis first name, but he's very much involved with, you know, the dietary guidelines, recommendations. Walter Willett. Walter Willett, thank you. I to him in person. Yeah, he doesn't like me. <laughs> he doesn't like you. I, I can see why. Why doesn't he like you? Because he loves vegetable oils and he doesn't think saturated fats are healthy. <laughs> right. And I disagree with both. <laughs> 
Good for you. Excellent. But he's actually, uh, so Loma Linda University on the West Coast in California is a university that was solely created by Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, Seventh-day Adventists have been, this goes back to Battle Creek, Michigan in the 1880s, you know, Kellogg's of Corn Flakes. And it's a fascinating story in how they proposed uh, vegetable-based and animals were you know, negative animal meat, eating flesh was negative because it made young people masturbate and so on and so forth. It actually declared that. And so it's bizarre, but it's still there. And in some countries like uh, Tasmania in particular, there's a physician there and his wife, you know, they made it a big opposition. So it's a smaller country and they can be disproportionately influential nice. that, that uh, he was being persecuted for, as a proponent of the ketogenic diet or low carb, high fat. And his wife couldn't figure out why they were against it. And she sort of did a couple of years of research on this and sort of brought the story up. And it's much bigger than what I said, but uh, Will, uh, Walter Willett was, is directly involved with him. So, yes, no, I, I, that, that would make sense. And in, in, in your personal experience, doctor, well, how do you use a ketogenic diet in, in, in patients? I know you work with some cancer patients. You mentioned it on your on your website, what is your, your views on using a ketogenic diet? Who do you think it helps uh, the most? It helps. I, I'm trying to actually have flipped the list. Who doesn't it help? You yeah, know, I would agree with that. <laughs> because first you start off with, and as Tom would say, you know, it's not like, hey, do the ketogenic diet, and this is what we're doing for cancer. It's adjunctive. You know, what else are they doing? And uh, so it, it's not a panacea in that way. It's, you know, it's now getting to the place The Walter Luongo did it with uh, chemotherapy and realized they could tolerate chemotherapy better. Well, that's, that's better. It's not exactly like saying what Tom is advocating, you know, let's do yeah. a three-day fast, which is what they used to do with epilepsy, three-day fast before yeah. they started the ketogenic diet. So what I'm doing now, I practice in Southern Connecticut for 16 years. So when I work with a cancer patient, it has to be, they have the regular doc because you're, you know, an MD that's seeing them. Yes. Then we can focus. So what I do is I have them lock down what they're actually eating. I so, see. you know, you're sort of the custodian of keeping them on track for that. But the majority of the people kind of how we make our income or how we're making it now is developing a course that's primarily for one is weight loss. That's the, that's the number one reason. And then you do these levels of blood work and the stories are so interesting of, you know, both we do uh, a regular lab panel, you know, um, I can go into that if you're interested. Then I do intracellular nutrition. That's very helpful. You know, what are they deficient in? Then we do a hormone panel, which is a urine over nearly 24 hours at different points. And yes. then, we look at their, then we look at their genome. So 23andMe downloaded to one of the many places. And so you get kind of a little, little better picture. You know, you can't rest it on any one, but it now opens areas of vulnerability. And so the background to that is putting them on a uh, on chronometer. You know, I say, hey, it's a free app. Let's follow it together. And I think That's now, one, yeah. you know, now what I'm going to, to add is a continual glucose monitor because the prices okay. have come down so much. You have Freestyle Libra, and some yes. of our clients are now just starting to use it. And it's such a windfall in the sense of a lot of people come in with an attitude, you know, yes. like you're going to tell them, unless they're on death row, meaning cancer, their compliance is not that high. I see. So I used to say that all, at least naturopathic practices, eventually mm -hmm. led towards working with cancer patients because they had the highest compliance. I see. So that's kind of the box that we're in. We can't go out in a limb. I don't know if any doc can. We can't go out in a limb and say, hey, I'm an oncologist, a naturopathic oncologist, and I'm working. Right. With. You sort of have to cushion it and saying we're doing that. And then you do the blood work. You know, not just ketones and uh, glucose, but, you know, doing fasting insulin, which is kind of like, duh. We've been doing that for 15 years. That clearly breaks out people who haven't been looked at before. And that's yes, an easy test. Then you can yes. go... I don't know how much you know about tests, but then you can go a little more esoteric and what their particular issues are. I am familiar with the stuff you're mentioning. And in particular, I just think that the framework that's provided for cancer patients nutritionally and, and, and in general is so inadequate. I mean, you're giving them, I mean, doctors are 
hammering them with Ensure or Boost just to try to get the calories up to, uh, straight, straight feeding the tumor straight. And then there's a whole prevention thing, right? The, like what you were exactly the, yep. the stuff you were mentioning. You have people who, who never have their, let, let alone a postprandial measurement of insulin, right? They, they're right. not even getting their fasting right. insulin measured. Right. And oh, and then they're surprised that they're insulin resistant. Or then, and they, you, you mentioned the freestyle libre. How, what is a, a cost that it goes for now in, in a, on a daily or, or weekly basis for patients? Well, you get, you, get, you get a cartridge, you know, that you put on your arm for 14 days. And so for that cartridge, I call it a cartridge, it's 70 yes. bucks. So what you do okay. is you give a prescription for cartridges. So they go yes. to the drugstore, CVS or Walgreens or whatever, and it just turns over. And uh, insurance may or may not cover it. So the $70 is insurance not covering it. So that's the worst case scenario. You just leave it up to them. You know, if your insurance covers it, good. If it doesn't, do it anyway. So now, so now they have, so for instance, uh, what I got, here's a, a guy who's on Freestyle Libra mm -hmm. and he hooked me up. So every time he takes a reading, so he has his phone, you have to have the newer iPhones. So yes. He just passes it over and I get a reading and then he gets a graph a weekly graph. And so I'll say, Hey, can you send me your graph? So it'll show me his band and then we'll have a discussion. What was this about? You know, what, what's see. this peak at? And why it was good for him, a guy who thought, you know, he took a, a few supplements. So that was good. Cause it made him feel good. I had to go through. I said, you know, you are actually diabetic. Don't everybody's yeah. called you that, but you're diabetic. And so what that means is then you have to set up that pathway. Mm -hmm. And this was still like, he wasn't believing me until he got that. I and see. I, and, and I can point and say, see that peak? That one thing alone, I can point to you and say, you now qualify for diabetes. You know, and you tell I them see. that. So it wakes them up a little bit. And now they get to see like that pizza they snuck on the side and thought they could get away with it because it, they didn't report it. I go, once they realize it took 14 hours for their insulin to come back down or their glucose, which is what this is, glucose, not insulin. I see. So that's dramatic to them. It's like now it's it's a whole new world. I see. I see. Because then there's a th most doctors because it's only covered by insurance for I think it's only covered for type one diabetics and most doctors and you mentioned the price of the freestyle lever. That's actually much better than what I expected. I know right. the Dexcom G6 is very expensive, like right. almost almost right. unless you're getting it prescribed by insurance. I think there's very few people who could pay that Absolutely. out of pocket. So that crazy. shift, I say it's in these last two weeks, you know, we've had all the different groups that I'm on about these different things. And when it came to CGMs, continual glucose monitors, you know, it's like saying that is such an educational tool to the, because what you're doing as a doctor, you're having to get the patient's buy-in. So I with see. cancer, it's easy, right? Their, their buy-in is if I don't do this, I'm going to die. So yes. there's not much convincing, but you back away from that. Even if you're dealing with MS or autoimmune and so on, they still feel is he telling the truth? Do I really have to do this? You get nice. that, you know, and they, they go have a banana because they thought it was better for their cramps, even though you told them magnesium. And they go, oh my gosh, it took me 10 hours to recuperate after a banana. Now they're getting it. This really nice. is low carb and we can make it good for you. But, you know, there you go. Makes but, sense. Makes sense. And do you have any sense, doctor, of how many people are, are using ketogenic diets in the treatment of cancer? I've heard other doctors put an estimate at around five to ten percent, but I, I'm not really sure. I would say it's a, it's a qualified number. So the yes. qualification would first come: how many people are actually doing it, and mostly that's on their own. How yes. many how many people are doing it with some sort of quote uh, director coach? Okay. So you know, that's the second part, and then the third part is how many people are doing it, are actually seeing an oncologist? You know, for yes because they're a cancer because they have cancer and how many of those oncologists know that said patient is actually doing the ketogenic diet i see you know and so i say mostly it's unreported so if you talk to oncologists they'd say two people in the country i'm being facetious a little bit but not much yes you go to a few of the coaches and i guess i would put myself in that yes category. you'd say all right maybe there's maybe there's a couple hundred okay and and then if you go to the people that are just doing it on their own, there's probably a lot more. So Okay. I see. I see. So it's a, it's a lot of patient empowering people 
um, listening to podcasts, going online, doing their own research, and then and then doing their their own. Which I, I still think in in the management of cancer, it's very helpful to have someone like yourself or at least a nutritionist that's watching over you because it's it is it can be a little bit tricky, especially at the beginning. Uh, using a, a ketogenic diet it's still i still see people very confused at, at, at exactly how to do it and then they have the, the questions about the saturated fats which some people still don't love and i think that's bogus so you, know, so you have that whole thing going on I, was, I think it's less that they still don't love it and more that they're still ignorant of how things have changed you know they go wait a minute my doctor said that that's what i want to share with you can you see this spreadsheet in front of you? I wanted, I wanted to show you a spreadsheet to say, this is, you know, here's where my, you know, I think um, good physicians base their work on the questions they ask themselves. Yes. You know, clinically. Yes, obviously. Yes. And a lot either have been pummeled through the course of their career Stop asking questions, just do scope of practice and get home by five o'clock. And I'm not saying they're lazy, but I'm saying that they have probably a number of threats on the other side, you know, if you yes. outside of your scope of practice. Anyway, I'm not in that because I have always been on the outside there. And yes. anyway, so this is a spreadsheet I put together. Uh, happens to be one of the groups we're working with. This happens to be on four obese men in their late 40s. They all have over 100 pounds to lose. So we go through, here's your CBC, so over here, CBC, I'm just gonna scoot yes. through some of these things. Got that, red, you know, RBC, uh, white blood cells, your lipid panel, which is really interesting is that, here's their lipid panel, which is like the thing most docs look at, you know, gee, yes. should we put you on a statin or not? They're all pretty good, you know, there's no, yeah. I mean, first of all, it's worthless to me. The only thing yeah. I, I use from that are triglycerides and HDL. The rest is just what the panel offers. And this yeah. is not particularly insightful. Nope. There's thyroid. That's interesting secondarily. But here's well, all, all of their TSHs look in, in, in range, which is. Yep. So here's some of the things I put together in one little area. So there's their fasting insulin, there's yes. their fasting glucose. And you can see this guy over here is, is a blatant diabetic. He, he's yeah. got meds, so he's That's getting off his meds, meds, right? But over here, these are, not, these are not high enough to be called diabetic. And this guy is, Quote, by, unquote, yeah. right? This guy by traditional standards is just barely out of range, right? 65 to 99. Yes. So his, his doc would have given him a buy. You know, you know, you're doing okay. Just, you know, he probably wouldn't even say less carbs. Cut the fruit. Nice. But- when you go to throw in the fasting insulin, you realize they're all, obviously the the diabetic is out of range, so yes. they're all out of range, and so yes. you realize this is it. You know, their you know their pancreas has been pounding for a while, so this now puts some pre diabetes in the very least. Um, and look at that inflammation down there, the HSCRP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you see That's inter higher than you'd like for all of them. That's right. Interesting correlation. Except the, the second one, yeah, that, that one's right. fine. So, I usually have not particularly high for, for any, any one of them. No, and the difference of these people is this person over here is not on any medication or mm -hmm. on any supplements. He's taking some supplements. He's I taking see. crazy supplements or having to get them off to sort of come back to normal. Uh, okay. He's sort of the undiagnosed or unbelieving diabetic, but he got the uh, Freestyle Libra, and now it's like, I see. gosh, I, I think I have to think of things. Um, I see. Here's the ALK phosphatase. So for some reason, something else is going on, the First one who's on. And I, and I tell him not to freak him out. Yes. This is what I look at. And this is, remind, these are just guys looking for weight loss, but a deeper dive. Let's look at your labs yes. and go forward. So now they know it's really about a health concern. It's just not weight loss. I wanted to scoot down. Nothing particular. These are still patients that can basically restore their, their quality of life. Look at their kidney function. It's still holding up pretty decently. Absolutely. Their, here's the, yep. Glucose uh, yep. regulation. Here's another area that isn't really tested. So serum folate and serum B12 are good things to take, but they're not always something you can bank on. And so I'll show you yeah. how I, I back up. But I take that, and I take homocysteine and methyl. Homocysteine, methyl yeah. Yep. And Which is high for the four of them. That's right. Well, you know, border, borderline with this one here. Line, yes. And so there's a CRP. I I reproduce that. There's their fish oil ratios, which is interesting. I mean, that's just a yeah. component. 
to address later. So this is a whole different panel. This is now intracellular. It's within the lymphocytes. And, it's right. a, and so this now starts to make some sense. These right. guys that had elevated homocysteine up there, yes. you go down and look what they're deficient in or borderline deficient. Well, deficient. Well, folate, folate. Folate. Yep. In choline, which I was, I, I recently learned is also involved in the methylation pathway, and it's also important to be taking some or eating eggs uh, at the least, at the very least, uh, for homocysteine as well. It's critical. No, it, it is critical, and so therefore you go into the the genome and you look for some SNPs, right? Yes. And and you look for those that have to do with neurotransmitters. You look for those that have to do with the methylation and the folate. And so now you go, all right, and, you know, you don't look for things that are untreatable. But yes. mostly the things in uh, methylation, you can A, get in with cofactors, you know, yes. say, hey, we need to either, if you really have a very slow enzyme, your SNP, yes. then we give the product on the other side of the SNP. It's like, yes, and then, or- How aggressive will you, will you be with the dosing of vitamin B12 and, and folate, for example, so. Initially, not, I, I, I try to put it in a context because- uh, I used to lecture at this at uh, UMass College of Pharmacy back in 2003 to 2010 um, yes. about genome relative to medications and so on. So back then, the simple answer was, oh, get methylated B12, get methylated folate. Yes, yes. Now that the conversation has matured a little bit, and it's really about choline deficiency as well, or yes. you, know, you notice that there's choline, choline. And so you're looking a little more in depth at the, the holism of the SNPs, you know, not just before and after. So we do do methylated folate and B12, yes. but choline. And so consequently, I say, you know, you know, uh, for those who have these SNPs, we need to get some methylation in there, you know, hence those two things. But I said, let's get the diet, you know, liver and egg yolk. If you lived on yes. nothing else, you'd do fine. Yes. You know, and so I, I tell them, we, we got to get some obvious things in your diet. And I'm more of a carnivore than I am, or I used to be pretty close to a vegetarian. I don't force them to be there, but I say, this is, you know, to me, carnivore isn't just meat. It's organ meat and uh, egg yolks. I'm not, yes. a big, I'm not a big dairy believer. Just yeah. so, but that's kind of where I come from. I do give the supplements. I don't want to wail on them initially because they will want to make a change and your body has to adapt. Uh, but eventually the goal is to take them off some of those things, you know, I and to get back to something that's food only. Otherwise people get anal about, you know, sticking to their supplements and you just like with the medication, you have to fill in the deficiencies. That's a good part. If they keep taking it beyond filling in the deficiencies, they're going to get an excess and that's yes. going to make it, you know, a whole nother, secondary group of problems. So you got to follow it and you have to educate them because you can't be dealing with a patient that says, you just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'm going to say, no, yes. we will do that. But I need you to understand why we're doing this because you're going to be your doctor, not me. In the future. So you're trying to stick as much to a paleo whole food, like just generally nutritionally based approach rather than hammering them with supplements, let alone pharmaceuticals. Or absolutely. Or uh, absolutely. I would prefer not to give supplements. And so in our practice, I don't know if you know about naturopathic practice, but we're practicing in Connecticut. So we had our own big pharmacy. You know, that was a good part of our income. Now I'll point to these are the products you should go to, go get them online and leave it at that. And you really... Yes. Just get down to a few because once you get to a few, you, unless you have some really well documented and pretty dire situation, you're building yourself a house of cards. You're asking somebody yes. to take too many things. There's just too many variables that you're having to follow. You know. Yes. But, yes. Yes. So I, I, that sounds that sounds very reasonable. So in, in, in if a, if a patient is struggling with compliance for a ketogenic diet, I, the, the the reason I've most often heard cited is just the social environment around them is, is maybe not optimal. Would you, in that case, would you consider giving them any, any kind of ketogenic meal replacement drink or any, any kind of supplement for, for, for real food? That's sort of the um, 
outside of cancer? No, because you know, if I can, because really, there's two things on the table. One is we're trying to get him back to food, you know, and we're really trying to get him away from processed foods. Yes. Right? Once you're into processed foods, you're into a lot of other additives, supplements, food colorings, and it's you're into a lot of bullshit. You know, it's just not yeah. real food. And it's certainly yeah. not holistic, even though we have a long list, you know? Yes. And so obviously you have to have products like that for even, you know, uh, breast milk formulas and so on and so forth, you know, because a child's not going to feed, what are your choices? Well, you can go on the market and get somebody else's breast milk and all that, or you come up with a formula. And so that's another area that's evolving, you know, away from soy formula and away from cow's milk into yeah. a more ketogenic. But other than that, but the th problem about drinks uh, like that, you know, uh, meal drinks, which everybody sort of likes to take, is yes. it tends to bring people back to the idea of, of looking for convenience and back to more processed foods. So processed yes. foods over the last couple of years has really been an addiction issue. Yes. And that has a lot to do with you know, transmitters, blah, 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 eating poor quality food. You know, and they'll say, yes. when I have them report on their chronometer and we talk at the end of the week and they go, oh, I did a drink over there. I did that drink. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, you're not going to get the, I guess that's, and I would say, don't eat that day then. You know, yes. fasting would be great. Don't eat for three days if you couldn't make up your mind. You yes. Know? Yes. And I, I just uh, in, in self-experimentation, this is something that is very easy for me to notice when I'm eating whole foods, just natural, you know, like vegetables, a little bit of protein, whatever. It's just impossible for me to gain any weight because my satiety signals kick in and I feel full. I feel, I feel energetic all the time. I'm, even if it's not, even if it's just a low carb diet and not, not strictly ketogenic, mm -hmm. it's still very hard to overeat or to develop a unhealthy relationship with food. But when you start bringing in even healthy stuff, right? Like protein bars or protein shakes, like mm -hmm. They're just sweetened in a way that makes me crave them in a way that I would never crave cauliflower or, or right. right. You know, like it's just you, 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 it does, I, I sense it does, it is doing something at a neurotransmitter level that's not helping people. So you're really focusing on establishing a, or, or bringing people back to a healthy relationship with, with, with food. It, it has to be, you know, I, I um, you know, when you start off your coaching, you, you make it kind of like for a free group. And then you move yes. on and it gets gradually more sophisticated and paying. And so you would find that very few people moved to non-processed foods. You know, they, the concept of doing that was you're making this un, unusually hard for us, you know, Dr. Carl, why are you doing this? It's like, it wasn't that, no, we're getting healthier and this is really going to change your life. So the issue of addiction is a big deal. By the way, I don't know if you know Nora Volkov, but she's Spanish, Mexican, educated in Mexico, University of Mexico, and okay. then, then was educated at, um, where she was it, Columbia? She was accepted at MIT. Anyway, she came on the scene, and her, it, her thing that she wanted to get involved in was drug addiction. And so uh, PET scans were just getting started, you know, where the glucose lights up the different parts of the brain, right? Yes. That's a PET scan. So she started identifying what PET scan images would look like for addictive people. What yes. part they have pizza, what part of the brain lights up. And she would compare it to, first it was just dietary. So, you know, she actually started with a drug, uh, drug addicts. And so she realized foods, certain foods are as addictive as certain drugs. And that means that it turns on certainly the dopamine and other pleasure centers, but it turns off your thinking part, you know, what they call the orbital prefrontal cortex. And that's, that was a breakthrough. So she's at the edge. And I think now she's the head of the U.S. government on addictions. And, and she's actually the great-granddaughter of Trotsky. <laughs> but, John Trotsky, yeah. I, I, that's how, what an interesting family lineage that is. Yes. And what, what you, obviously, I mean, in speaking with someone like you, it's very easy to speak about diet and the importance. But what has prevented most physicians from from really adopting dietary interventions as being important even even sleep like when when has a pcp come in with their patients and said like hey dude maybe you're you have this inflammation or you have a headache like hey have you tried sleeping for eight hours for two weeks and then come back and, and tell me if the, the symptoms remain right so why why are we still 
treating things with, with molecules, with medicines, in, instead of using this more sort of holistic approach? Well, in one way, you're sort of asking that question to the wrong guy because I went to I empathic school and I started because of that question, right? Yes. So, yes. but the answer, now that I know a lot of MDs and, and, you know, through the decades and you get to see what they do, I think that they never, they, they didn't, they, well, the, the traditional answer is, is that they didn't have the education and it's not, all right, okay, and you forgive them for that. And, but it's really a degree of common sense and there's enough information out there. So why isn't it recommended now? It's because it's either A, outside their scope of practice, or B, they don't think the patient's gonna be compliant, and C, they wanna be home by five o'clock, they're tired of practice. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so or it's or they have 15 minutes with each patient and it's just hard to explain the nuances of. That's of right, but you know, the parallel between that conversation if why don't they offer these more holistic things that A, could be cheaper if they did it uh, on a countrywide and for the person. And then you go look on Amazon and go, hey, um, I don't know, put in diabetes, put in uh, keto and look at all these bogus products out there. Everybody wants a product for their situation. So yes. it's more of a cultural thing that the patient brings to the doctor and the I doctor see. has to deal with a pretty narrow perspective. I see. That makes sense. And one, one last topic I wanted to ask your opinion on, doctor, is you, you mentioned the, the importance of optimizing for, for toxin clearance in, in the body. Which, which levers do you use to, to accomplish this? I, I myself try to get a little bit of sauna each week and obviously load up on the cruciferous veggies and, and, and do some, some exercise to sweat out the, the toxins. But it is, it does appear to be, even in the food, like I I don't know in, in, in exactly where this is coming from, but I, I do see that the tuna that I get here in Mexico has a lot of uh, mercury. So, so you, you, you probably want to avoid that. And I also see that some of the uh, vegetables have some, 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 some stuff that, that you would rather not consume. So what's your, what's your take on that? Or how do you guide patients to avoid toxins as much as possible? Well, the tuna is a, it's a great example. It's like, you know, uh, there's a, a Facebook group. There's an organization called Environmental Working Group. So yes. And so back when they started, I think that was probably 2005-ish or maybe yeah. 2000, that they actually, you know, they had certain topics. They had the, you know, the, the Dirty Dozen and the, the, the Clean 15 and the Toxic whatever. And that was a great, you know, that was a novel approach. They went to produce and started pulling them out and saying, these are the ones you find are most contaminated, meaning they have the most pesticides on them. And then they would measure, you know, what those pesticides were and what those pesticides did. You know, did they suppress immune system? Did they affect your neurological system? And it was like profound. So just that whole approach, you know, now they're out there and people just go, oh, the dirty dozen, clean 15. But if they do, if they are vegetarian and they do the clean 15 that really is organic, you know, they've avoided continued exposure to what they got before. So that's a big deal. Parkinson's is associated with some of the pesticides, by the way. Neurological. Alzheimer's as well, yes. Alzheimer's as well, both neurological. Um, so what we used to do in Connecticut, we would do heavy, heavy metals, you know, and so heavy metals was a big deal. And you know, back to tuna. So Environmental Working Group actually had a site on tuna, and they'd rank all the tuna products. And mm -hmm. they would have a a tuna can and they you know do like a pie what percent was mercury kind of thing and they obviously the lobby got against them and they had to drop that website mm. they couldn't talk about it and we used to even have through them and another company they listed all the fish you know you had uh, what they call tile fish which is like a really big mackerel and then you had king mackerel you obviously had tuna at swordfish was like usually the worst and then a particular kind swordfish. of shark you know, and then it went down the list and so that was wiped out. So the, you couldn't have access to that information. So first is about patient education. First, if you can do a test like a heavy metals test and saying, yep, yes. you know, and then you associate it with, you gave me your seven day diet diary and you've been eating a lot of tuna, they get it. You know, they're gonna stop that. But if they stop that, what that means is their blood serum levels will gradually decrease, but it goes off to their fat cells. You know, it doesn't go out with the urine. It gets stored, and that's the whole bioaccumulation. Yeah, yes. You know, the whole bio. Why little fish eats bigger fish, eats bigger fish, and so. Yes. So, so what this is, stuff is insidious and it's dangerous. I mean, it, it really is. It's it's such a big issue 
that uh, within the keto conferences, they don't want to talk about that. It gets, you know, it's like opening a can of worms. They'll go, ah, I don't know about heavy metals. Ah, the, you know, the environmental estrogens, ah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> you know, I've, I've read case, patient cases documented by, by Dale Beretson on, on people just basically getting impaired cognition and, and cognitive decline accelerated just by the presence of these heavy metals. And once they, they do something to remove them or they tweak the diet, these, their symptoms start to go away. So the, 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 it's, it's incredible the, the potential that these toxins have on the, the negative potential that they have to disrupt our hormonal and, and biological systems. It's huge. It's huge. And uh, one of my trainings post getting out of med school was an environmental medicine. So it was a whole other course for a year. And yes. it, it is both very fascinating. So, but back to heavy metals is, is taken out by chelation, you know, and then you have to yes. separate the body to deal with the chelator. So it's yes. a process, you know, and it's busy. With those situations, things like sauna and exercise are, are not directly helpful. They're, they're okay. partially, but that's not, that's usually helpful in the thing with like with pesticides and, um, off gassing of various things from paints to carpets and so on and so forth. Those are also neurologically damaging and I see. phthalates and BPA. Um, they're not always measurable. You know, you, you basically get their metabolic breakdown products. They kind of yes. go through you, create the damage and are gone. So you sort of see the, the house wreck. The downstream products. Yeah. 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 Um, so for those, the sauna on a regular basis is good, but a lower heat and a prolonged exposure. You know, so let's say 140s, 150s Fahrenheit is okay. Not, you know, not getting ego high heat of 190 and, and you yes. know, that's, that's stupid. Um, because yes. you want a slow release through your sweat and, and there is kind of a release. And so you do get better, not heavy metals, but other things. So it is a big deal. I see. Other than that, you know, sauna is actually a big, big deal. So you do some exercise because now you're, you're accessing fat. That's the whole key there was lipolysis. You want to break down the fat, get it in the blood, get the blood to go partly out to the sweat, you know, and out with the urine and the stool, as the case may be. And if they did that on a regular basis, at least they, in addition to minimizing exposure, right? Because you have to do that history on that patient of where did this stuff come from? You know, yes. and you have to sort of figure that out. Is it childhood? Is it the house they're living in now? Is it? Yes. And so that's a little bit of sleuthing. And if you have a handle on that, and maybe it's obvious, the tuna would be obvious. That's an easy one. Yes. Um, exogenous uh, or environmental estrogens would be less yes. obvious. Yes. I, I've begun reading Dr. Anthony Jay's book called Estrogeneration, and, and seeing he basically goes very in-depth about how uh, all of these pesticides, chemicals, even some of the stuff we – this is something I, I think I – I'm fortunate enough to have my diet, sleep, dialed in exercise. But something I never thought about is, yeah, I just go to the supermarket and I buy these uh, degree the other ends, not, not to point a finger specifically at them, but I just buy these the other ends, which had aluminum, right? Put, you know, whatever kind of moisturizer on my face. And, and then you go on, a, there's this da database online called skindeep.org. Yep, and, yep. and, and these things are like, uh, like proven cancer, like cancer inducing chemicals. These are proven neurodegenerative. It's <laughs> true. Like now I need to start even paying attention to the stuff, which makes sense, right? I mean, you're rubbing it in your body. You're getting right, absorption right. from there. And, and I do, since I started using all these different products a couple of months ago, I do sense, uh, it may be subtle, but I do sense a difference. Even in, in the, the amount of sweat I'm producing, I'm just, sweating one third of the amount that I was sweating before because when you go off the aluminum horrible deodorant or anti-transparent whatever you you start uh it's like you've been blocking out your sweat for for however long right so it accumulates and then you start sweating a lot and then now it has controlled but it's it's very scary I mean it's linked to breast cancer uh it's it's linked to all kinds of, of stuff you don't want a neurodegenerative disease even I think I, I forget the this very common ingredient in the in, in toothpaste. I think it's called I, yeah fluoride. Fluoride is neurodegenerative. Like holy crap! Like now I need to buy you know there's this brand Hello toothpaste or whatever they produce toothpaste that doesn't have that crap. So now I <laughs> but it's just very insidious and it's hard to. That's why I say it's tricky and I do think it's 
helpful for patients to work with doctors like yourself because it is like you, you, you just wouldn't imagine that you'd be, you know, that a moisturizer would have stuff that is hurting you hormonally. Oh, parabens, you, parabens. Parabens, right? yes, right? another one. And fragrances in, in just in general, I mean. Absolutely. There was, uh, so connecting Harvard with fluoride, punch that into Google. I forgot who it was, but they were very much part of the fluoride industry. I don't know if they still are, but nice. there was a number of professors research. Now we're going back 30, 10 to 30 years ago that at least publicly were kind of brought to task saying, you know, it's to show that there was, you know, kind of like when you're behind the sugar industry and saying it's all healthy, but there's that. But yeah, once you, so can you imagine a patient comes in and so where are you going to start? So they have to sort of do a lot of their own history. So you send them forms and yes. then given what we've talked about so far, I would say 95, if not 99% of most people would have stopped listening a good half hour ago because yes. you've now exceeded their threshold to understand what you're, you know, it's just too many things. Yes. Now, now we pointed out too many things. They've now gone, I'm going to die anyway. I don't care. Yeah. So you got to pull back and give them small pieces that they can act on and hopefully feel better from. You know, you can't just go, hey, this is good for longevity. Well, what does that feel like? Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, it, it's always so hard because these are things, I mean, you unfortunately, I say unfortunately, because having immediate feedback systems allows us to, to make faster changes. These are things that you will see, like I'm 20 years old, right? Like most of my friends are completely mindless about the stuff they, they eat or how they sleep. And, and, and they feel fine, right? Because they're young. But in 20 or 30 years, they're, they're, they're going to, start to see so it's very i i do empathize with people there it's very hard to commit to things that right like how much easier is it to just go on a high carb diet go to the gym eat a bunch of protein bars and yeah hammer your your kidneys with a bunch of unnecessary protein and crap drink a bunch of whey protein which is very insulogenic and, and just look good versus okay i'm gonna even starting now even though i'm young i'm gonna start thinking about these things and you know, it, it will compound eventually and you will reap the rewards of, of doing such a thing. But it is, it can be overwhelming. And I do, I get a lot of pushback from, from my friends, even family members. And they say, well, all this stuff you're doing is just stressing you out more and you're not enjoying life. And I, I, I've always, maybe it's just the way I'm wired, but I've always been very, I, I, I've never found a compelling argument about why not eating sugar or why <laughs> sleeping well would make me more stressed, right? Or why... Just being mindful about the decisions I'm, I'm making in, in regards to my personal care products, right? Like, how is that stuff making, you know, it's, it's actually empowering. Like, I, when I discovered all of that stuff behind the cosmetic products, I was actually very empowered. Like, wow, like, I'm actually now in control of, of the stuff I'm putting into my body, right? And it, 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 does, it does, I mean, at least for me, it, it does create a, a very sort of empowering sense of, of okay. taking control. Well, it is the way you're wired, and to put a collective term over it, it's kind of personal responsibility slash maturity, you know, and, and it's a gradient that some people never reach, or some people reach very soon. You know, some people, you meet them in their 60s, and they still never are very mature. You know, that, yes. you know it's like a cocktail party, which I don't think I've, have I been to one in my life. Um, it's how much superficial conversation that has no point to it whatsoever can you do, you know? Yes. And, and there's some people that thrive at that. I, I can't. Yeah. I would choke and shoot myself. Yeah, me, me, me too. Very, very likely. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, but to your, your thinking behind the call is that helping out with a product that's better than Insure and all these others, there's a number of companies that are on it. I mean, so the whole BHB, you know, ketones, ketones yes. exogenous ketones and blah, blah, blah. It, especially speaking of DOM, is that, yeah, that is directly useful for cancer, as Tom will tell you as well. And so now they're saying, well, how they put the products around it. I mean, the whole, the, the rise and fall of exogenous ketones for everything has, has gone by. It's not for everything. Yes. It's, it's for, you know, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, and so on and so forth. And done in a very disciplined way. And so now they're trying to put other things together to make a healthy, just you're saying, your healthy keto drink. And for those situations, yes. it's very appropriate. You know, a, an Alzheimer's patient is not going to be holistic no, yes mostly, mostly, mostly gonna have to... yeah because with healthy people like there's no need to at least in, in our humble opinion both you and i agree in this there's no need to 
to, to take them down that road of, of replacing meals with, with drinks. But for metabolically, like for very ill patients, I think yeah. the stuff they're doing is, is exciting. And I, I wish uh, that there was a, a manuscript published, I think it was two or three weeks ago, summarizing, or, or maybe a little bit more than that, like two months ago, summarizing all the clinical trials, both in vitro and in vivo, and, and regarding using a ketogenic diet for the treatment of cancer. It's many, many trials, and obviously there's many underway the, as well. But the, I, I just came away from that paper saying like, wow, like we're still really, you know, like here you go to the oncologist and you're greeted in the office. And these are good people. I don't, I, it's not nothing personal, but you're greeted with a bowl of candy right in the way <laughs> for the oncologist. Like really? So you're, you're exposing your patients to, to chemotherapy, all of this stuff, and you're not even bothering to tell them that, hey, there's this, and, and, and you know, I, I hate when people point at evidence-based medicine and say, well, you know, all of your keto stuff for cancer is inconclusive. It still has not been proven in a formal clinical trial for, okay, and then I'm, okay, so the alternative to that is, yeah, what we do know for sure is that eating sugar and eating processed foods is gonna, is not gonna do any good for the patient. So, right, like why not just, even, even if you're not as optimistic about it as Tom is or as I am or as you are, like, why not just, just try it? Like, what are you, as if the alternative were any better, right? Like, oh, yeah, just keep on taking your orange juice in the morning and let's hope that cancer goes away by itself. Like, come I agree. on. I agree. Medical negligence. I agree. No, that is the, that is the appropriate word. Um, but I think now that you've asked the questions, you have to flip it and saying, so why would a reasonable person, male or female, physician or in the health industry, not do this? You know, I mean, yes. it's not like you and I are, you know, geniuses in our own right. We've just sort of like, absolutely, plugged, you know, plugged along on this particular information and asked these questions. Why aren't they asking those questions? And the answer I come up with that is that they have incentivized to look elsewhere. You know, they're, yes. and it's unfortunate. And so that's the reality. It's like, how have our presidents been so ineffective? You know, and why, why is the process so commercial? Well, yes. it's because the money's there, you know, and, yes. and I'm not being cynical. I'm, I'm, I'm at the age of saying, I want to know how it is and I'll deal with reality instead of wishful thinking, you know? Yes. So yes, I, yes. yeah. No, and I think you're on the right track. What I do, what does encourage me to, to wrap this up is to see people like yourself and, and other doctors and nutritionists starting to guide patients in the, the right direction. And I do think it's starting, I do see a lot of, uh, discomfort in, in, in patients, me being a patient myself, uh, with the traditional way medicine is given. Like I do see many people complain about the small times they have with their doctors and the, the information is starting to spread. You have great people like Dr. Matthew Walker, who has written extensively on sleep and you, you're, you're starting to get people like, hey, pay, pay a little bit more of attention to stuff like that meditation, obviously, and, and mm -hmm. clean nutrition as well. But we're still a long way uh, from from getting to the point where everybody every cancer patient is getting treated with a KD, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. All those. So anyway, we see the reality in the same way, uh, and you plug in and, and do what you can. Uh, one comment you might be thought you might be interested in. So there, one of the conferences I've been going to is called Low Carb USA. It's been going on yes. for a couple of years, and I enjoy the speakers and I know the the guys that run it, and I've learned a lot there too, and it's changed my thinking. He's uh, Doug Reynolds and his wife Pam have, yes. have brought together a lot of their speakers to come up with clinical guidelines for low carb. Yes. So, the whole issue that you and I have started back on why don't doctors do X? And it's because of standard of care within whatever their field is. You know, a hmm. standard of care is not well defined. It's just sort of saying, hey, it's common practice. We all know this. That's not part of our common practice. We're not going to do this thing you're talking about. So, for them to thwart that or give it a very short half-life is to come up and they have, this is, I think, probably 30 doctors put this together and some journalists that helped do the writing. It's called Clinical Guidelines. I'll uh, download it and send you a copy. And Thank so, you. In essence, what's trying to be disseminated, you know, but for those who are open to it, absolutely the right thing. For those who are yes. closed, it's water off a duck's back. Yeah, it will, it will not do, it will not, if, if they don't want to believe it, they won't then. I, and this is just talking, we, we spent all of the talk using the U.S. as a reference. Like, I, I don't even want to tell you how <laughs> lacking the information here in, in Mexico. And we're supposed to be neighbors to the U.S., right? Like, there's not even, 
Yeah, I, I don't even think people still understand what a keto diet is here. At least in the U.S., you, you see some keto products and you see people sort of talk about it more and it, it's very famous in the weight loss circles. But here, not even. <laughs> like people here still try to lose weight, uh, you know, yeah. calorie restricting or whatever. So I, I, I do hope it starts to, to spread here. In, in Latin America, we have the highest incidences of NAFLD because we have some I think Hispanic Americans have a are have a much wider or a larger percentage of the population has a gene mutation that predisposes them to develop NAFLD when when taking mm -hmm. fructose. And of course, people here love fruit and orange juice and everything. So I think it's it's about time that hopefully there's it starts to spread right. Then these great books from Tom and Miriam Kalami and whatever start to get translated into into Spanish hopefully soon. But yeah, I think that will be, they, they'd be more than thrilled to do that. You know, I'm looking for yes. the, you know, Tom came out with this tome, <laughs> his big book. I, I have it here just yeah. right next to me, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and since then, so much has been updated, you know, I mean, yeah, anyway, so there you go. Um, he's a wonderful guy and he hit the right things. I was going to ask you, I like the way this conversation has gone. Could I put this on as a podcast? It's audio, it's not visual. Absolutely, doctor. If, if anybody cares to listen to a Harvard student rant about uh, <laughs> you know, nutrition for one hour, if anybody wants to spend one hour doing that, then absolutely, no, no problem on my part. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a um, I want to say it's a it's an intelligent conversation to have, and you're asking a lot of the right questions. And initially, when we went back and forth in emails, I thought, oh, this guy sounds too naive, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so now I appreciate the fact that. Uh, I know where you're coming from, and uh, you're much more informed than I thought. You know. Thanks, uh, doctor. I still think I'm very naive in many things, but I, I'm looking and and researching and and just trying to get my my head wrapped around as much information as I can. Um, yeah. Well, you met you met the right people, and you're doing the right thing. Keep in touch. I will do this, and I'll send you a link sure. to the podcast when it comes out. Absolutely, doctor. Thank you very much. I'm actually gonna go and ask. I have a doctor here that I work with, I'm going to ask him to, to get me a prescription for the Freestyle Libre and, and start monitoring my, my glucose as well, because it, it, it does provide a very effective feedback system to regulate my, my nutrition. So thanks for suggesting that. Here's, a, here's an interesting thing. There is a, um, and how I got into looking at the Freestyle Libre for my clients, and I, I think I'll get it for myself as well, is that there was a, uh, one of the presenters at the Low Carb Conference years ago, that means three or four years ago, He's a runner, very skinny. You know, he's he's changed his life. He even does barefoot running, meaning marathon wise, and like in uh, sandals. I mean, it's like whoa. Yes. So he he looks really fit, and he is really fit. So he got a freestyle libra, and he always said before he got that, he said uh, he had this thing about in the middle of the night, he would wake up about two o'clock in the morning, have to go down to the kitchen to have a bowl of cereal. You know, so carbs, because he that was just what he'd been doing for the last yes. 20 years. And he never thought that anything of it. So now he gets his freestyle Libra and he could see his at night blood sugar rise and fall and what a difference that made. So technically he realized with the data that he saw, he was borderline type one diabetic. I see. Interesting. So Interesting. a lot will be revealed. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure, Doc, and we'll we'll keep in touch. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Take care. See you. Bye bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to Dr. Goldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and I will get back to you. One thing I want to say, a number of questions have come in in which I've given this answer and the email didn't work. So just make sure that you're receiving at the same email that you sent it in. And I think that might have been the difficulty. So I look forward to your questions. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that I'm open to answer your questions. And I think this world of keto is not just black and white. 
you know, it's nice that it's simple, but it's not simple for some. I'm really trying to, you know, go down as any of you who have listened to all my podcasts, we started way back when history and evolution, epilepsy, and so on and so forth. You know, now we're seeing some tremendous overlap in uh, various uh, mental disorders, such as schizophrenia or neurological disorders that are not just epilepsy. And also, just for people and losing weight, it's sometimes pretty complicated for them to engage in keto, and so they need some help. And so that's the whole point of, at least that's what I think I'm doing, is exploring the world of why are, why are there other factors. And so in exploring some of those other factors, we've covered addiction, we've covered hormones, we've covered uh, nutritional deficiencies, we've covered uh, certain metabolic lab results, and we'll go further. We'll even get to more on genome and aspects. So these are all just contributions that make for an obstacle for some people to engage easily in the ketogenic diet. This is my belief, and these are the things that I've discovered. And I think other people have discovered some of these things, but not ever put them together. So stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.